Hi, I'm Megan Wise, and this is my presentation, Lifting Voices, Suffer Drugs, and Sharon Loudon. We often forget about the things that have become normal for us. Things like driving a car or attending college courses, both things that we have long been able to do without much complication. However, there are still important parts of our lives that we often take for granted. Possibly one of the most important of these activities, an event which is constantly changing the course of history, voting. UCA and New York-based artist Sharon Loudon sought to remind us of this privilege through the work Suffrage Drugs, Amplifying Voices of Unheard Women, a work of public art completed in September 2020 and located in UCA's alumni circle. This project worked not only as a piece of public education and enrichment, but also served as what feels like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for students. Sharon Loudon, a New York-based artist, works in a range of media from painting, sculpture, animation, and more. She is equally known for her work as an author, an educator, and an advocate for the arts. Her Living and Sustaining a Creative Life series of books, which she edits, is in its seventh printing with sales in more than 24 countries. Loudon is also the Artistic Director of Visual Arts at the Chautauqua Institution. One of her most prominent series titled Windows, first appeared in 2015 in the Tweed Museum of Art in Dunluth, Minnesota. This, the work is comprised of hundreds of pieces of aluminum in both sheets and strips, creating a visual effect that not only expands the limits of the room, but also feels endless. Windows has appeared in various other venues over the years. This list includes the University of Wyoming, the Filbert Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the headquarters of Maybury Bank in Oklahoma City. Clearly Loudon does not discriminate when it comes to locations for her artworks. Her work resides in museums, colleges, businesses, and private residences. Loudon Shag Pools, a work installed in 2015 in Fransonia Sculpture Park in Schaefer, Minnesota, served as the inspiration for the work later installed at the University of Central Arkansas. Loudon intended shag pools to serve as a nod towards nostalgia for those ar around to remember the widespread phenomena of shag carpeting. Made of pink quartz, Fort Dodge white stone, cocoa and recycled glass, Loudon's rugs are laid in square rings to portray a pattern one may see on a rug of some kind. Loudon intentionally created these pieces to blend in with the landscape in which they are placed. This was to create a certain element of surprise for those who happened upon the outdoor installation. In a discussion with the artist, she remarked that the pools are meant to evoke the unseen work of women, craft work for the home that often went unnoticed and undervalued. Loud and shag pools then serve not only as a reminder of women's traditional work, but also serve, provides a gesture of thanks for their unseen work. UCA suffer drugs represent a second iteration of Loudon's stone and glass carpets. What began as a conversation between two old friends in 2019 turned into a community-wide event in the fall of 2020. This event titled Shall Not Be Denied, UCA Suffrage Centennial Celebration, conceived and produced by Dr. Gail Seymour, Associate Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, used the arts to mark the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which made voting for 27 million in 1920 the law of the land. The project, however, reminded viewers that the amendment excluded Black and Indigenous women who did not have access to voting until 1965 with the, voting, with the passing of the Voting Rights Act. Yes, we were celebrating 1920, a moment of progress, but not progress for all. When Loudon became the feature artist for the Suffered Centennial Celebration, made possible by a major grant from the National Endowment of the Arts, she insisted that the project include paid internship opportunities for students. These students would help to design a portion of the piece, learn professional development skills, and eventually assist with installing the works. These were obviously pre-COVID plans, with the pandemic lockdown, it became clear that Loudon would develop and direct the project remotely. The students' be interns became essential to the project happening at all. Loudon held a group interview with students just weeks before the lockdown. It was open to all students on campus, though the majority of those who attended the meeting were fine arts majors, aside from one computer science major and me, an art history major. To be honest, I almost did not attend this meeting. I was only in attendance because Dr. Seymour hunted me down and told, told me that I needed to attend. What you quickly learn here in the art history department at UCA is when Dr. Seymour suggests you do something, it's in your best interest to do so. 
Entering into a room of about 20 people felt pretty intimidating, especially because they all seemed to be far more qualified for this project than I was. I had taken a couple of drawing and design classes, but nothing like many of these other individuals had. This only made me more nervous when Latin came on screen and greeted us. She asked one question, why is this project important to you? Everyone went around the room first introducing themselves and then answering the question. Finally, I, thankfully I was towards the end and had plenty of time to go over my answer. When it did finally get around to me, I of course introduced myself and then I started talking about my sister a black and Hispanic woman and how I wanted her to have the opportunity to look at a work of art and see herself in it. A couple of weeks later, I received an email from Loudon herself asking if I would be interested in being one of the six interns on the project. I almost immediately emailed back and explaining how excited I was. I attended our first official meeting a few months later via Zoom with Loudon and her husband, Vincent Vallega, who serves as her project manager. These meetings became part of my weekly routine that summer. It was always fun to log on and see what everyone had been up to and to learn what our assignment for that week was going to be. We began with something I feel I'm pretty good at, research. However, this was paired with something I'm not so good at, which is drawing. Our first real task was to research symbols and stories of the suffrage movement. After doing so, we needed to give her 60 sketches. Now, this doesn't sound like much, but when you procrastinate like me, it turns into a much bigger problem. Nevertheless, the sketches got completed and we presented them over the next couple of weeks, trying to get a feel for what we wanted. After Sharon had told us what she thought were the best, we reworked them and reworked them and reworked them until we came up with our final sketches that were included with our artist statements. During this time, we all received a lot of encouragement and inspiration from our leaders. They both often made sure that everything was going well and Loudon often provided much needed advice. Some of this advice sounded a bit different to me, um, because I'm not quite in the same realm as these other artists that I was working with, um, but this was often a talking point between Sharon and I. She refused to let me call myself anything but an artist, even when saying, okay, well, I may be an artist, but I'm mainly an academic. This is not good enough for her. She wanted to make sure that everyone involved in this process knew that they were meant to be there no matter their background. Next came the issue of figuring out which materials we were going to use. We had a budget, so we really needed things that we could get within the state, or at least from a state that borders Arkansas. Very quickly, we came upon a problem. Arkansas does not recycle glass. Arkansans do put glass in our recycling bins. However, Arkansas ships it all out of state. This project really needed glass. It was one of the main materials used in shag pools and wouldn't really be the same without it. We also discovered the difficulty of sourcing, sourcing colored rock. You can buy colored rock, however, it is typically a mix of colors and it wasn't really going to work. Eventually, the issue of the glass was settled when it was decided to simply order out of state, but we were still faced with the issue of the colored rock. That's where the recycled rubber was brought into the conversation by one of the interns. If you grew up in the early 2000s to now, you might remember going to a playground that was covered in little bits of rubber instead of wood shavings, and that's the exact same rubber that we used. Our team was able to partner with Mulch That Matters, the oldest tire recycling company in the world, headquartered in Little Rock. A bonus was that the owner was an alum of UCA and would paint all the rubber in whatever colors we needed. These two roadblocks became great learning moments for our intern internship team. We were able to see that things were not going to always be as planned and that it was important to be able to push past that. I think that lesson is really applicable in any situation and not just in this art context. One of the hardest parts of this project was not the installment, but cold calling materials vendors. Latin asked us, to test us with reaching out to various vendors that we had researched. Now, for most people, this wouldn't be difficult. The only problem is I hate talking on the phone. It also did not help that the first few places that I found had pretty extensive websites. Everything I was supposed to ask was already out there to see, but I still needed to call for the experience. Thankfully, project manager Vallega called a few glass recycling facilities out of state and recorded his calls. This way, we were able to get a feel for how the calls were supposed to go. This was a resource I heavily utilized. I sat down and really analyzed each of the calls and wrote out a little script for myself. And eventually we had made all of our calls and logged them so our lead artists could call the businesses they thought would be best for the project. We spent a lot of time waiting on materials due to COVID related issues in the supply chain. Again, we faced delays. We had glass coming in from out of state. Sometimes it was just a case of not things not being delivered to the business that we were working with. During this time, we learned how to make invoices. For me, this was the most practical skill that I learned. However, it was definitely the most tedious. 
more than and, and more than anything, these behind the scenes aspects of creating large scale public art, sourcing materials and creating invoices made us feel like real artists and that we were really part of this team of creators. By September, we were ready to install the piece. Loudon and Vallega, of course, were not on site due to COVID. However, they had hired two on-site project managers, artist Melissa Cowper-Smith and technician Robbie Burton, both UCA employees. We showed up in front of Old Main in varying degrees of work clothes and gloves in late September, early October. For many states, this would be tolerable. However, in Arkansas, I think we all know that these three months are still often part of summer. Installation of the two 30 by 30 feet stone, glass, and rubber mulch rugs was an extensive process. We carried 50 pound bags of white rock to this site before we could cut the bags open and dump the rock into its designated section. This was decently manageable because the materials were right next to this rug. However, we also had to remember that we were stepping down into a two inch deep hole. Once we had about an inch of the white rock built up, we began to spread blue and green glass over the top. The effect it gave was beautiful. In that first day, we had moved two tons of material in four hours, all by hand. The next few days of insulation seemed to fly by. We added rings of rubber mulch of varying colors to the outside of the first rug and it was finished. The rug provided much easier to move than bags of rock. We used what were essentially sleds to move around the rubber mulch that we shoveled out of bags. The second rug designed by the student interns features a center square of gold glass, a ring of purple rubber mulch, and then a ring of white sand. We made progress much faster this day as the materials were much lighter, meaning we could move more in one go. Then it had finally come for the interns to begin their individual work. Within the outer ring, each student created their own section of the rug. My own design features a brown column with a large white square on either side on a purple background. This design references African-American suffragist Ida B. Wells and her Alpha Suffrage Club. In 1913, the National American Women's Suffrage Association strategically organized a spectacular parade in Washington, DC, the day before President Wilson's inauguration. When Wells approached them about marching alongside them, they were told to march at the end or not at all. Instead, Wells took her group to the side with spectators where they waited. Then when the white suffragists passed, they jumped into the parade behind them to march with them. This design was meant to capture the moment of Wells breaking through the crowd. The design to the left of mine by Claire Webb features a heart shape made of green and blue glass, a shape made of red glass, and a shape made of white rock and blue glass. All of this is set on a back black background. This design references Marsha P. Johnson, a pioneering trans woman of color. The green shape represents growth and health, the red shape, the complement of green, a nod to the intensity of the heart, and the white shape symbolizing light and hope for the future. The dark background represents the world of black and hearts that surrounded Marcia and others. Despite hatred and discrimination, she endured her unwavering heart remaining open and bright. The next design is by Desiree Coleman. This design features a large gold glass arrow with red glass sprinkles throughout. The arrow points to a red glass platform and a gold glass apple shape. All of this is set against a black rubber mulch background. The most prominent meaning of this piece is the marginalization of the women who were left out of the suffrage movement. The large arrow is meant to express the energy that led the suffragists to of color to take action. The arrow lifts a red rectangle symbolizing the passion of the suffragists who rose up and fought for their beliefs. The yellow shape is representation of a forbidden fruit. In this instance, it is those who were left out of the movement by using their voices to fight for what they believed was theirs. The next design is by Logan Gaston. This work shows two large birds, one made of white rock and the other of gold glass. They are set behind white bars made of rock on a black rubber mulch background. This work broadly represents arrests and imprisonment of suffragists such as Lucy Barnes and 32 other women who endured brutal beatings in jail in 1917. The bars also reference the discriminatory practices of our current prison system. The National Women's Party wore cell door pins to represent those who had been arrested during protests, giving a historical context to the bars in this design. In a more modern spin, the bars represent the current state of the prison system and the staggering amount of minorities who have been arrested. This is represented by the large gold bird. The next design is by Savannah Pelly. This design features three purple fists surrounded by a ring of brown and gold. 
There is also a green band that goes across this work over the black or over the brown background with a black border. This is all made of rubber mulch except for the gold ring and the green band. The race fist has become a prominent part of our culture, especially today with its ties to the Black Lives Matter movement and other social protests. The ring of brown and gold surrounding each fist is meant to represent sunflowers, a prominent symbol of the suffrage movement. The brown of the sunflowers is also meant re to represent those left out of this movement. The green band is a nod toward the UK's women's social and political union, which is thought to have first inspired the suffrage movement in the US. Finally, the black border around this work is meant to symbolize those who pass before seeing the fruits of their labor. The final design is by Adriana Kimball Ray. This design is a black rubber mulch background with designs created out of blue glass. Adriana explained that the triangles you see are the alchemic symbols for the earth. This symbol was used because everyone comes from the earth, no matter their sex. The female and male symbols do represent the sexes, but are also said to represent copper and iron, two very strong metals. The main theme of this design meaning strength and unity. As a whole, this suffrage rug represents the various stories and themes of the suffrage movement and how they mirror our modern time. As the full title, Suffrage Drugs, Amplifying Voices of Unheard Women, implies, this main goal of this piece was to give a voice to those who were left out of this movement, which leads us into the first of the suffrage drugs. This rug was completely designed by Sharon Loudon and is meant to represent the land and space that was owed to Black, Indigenous, and other women of color. This piece was designed to be a temporary part of the landscape that highlights the achievements and lives of the women who fought for their right to vote and those who continue to fight even after being shut out. The last piece of this project was an animation made by Loudon and Brian Klein. This animation titled Seen and Heard Amplifying Gratitude was played in conjunction with the installations. It shows our thanks to those women left out of the suffrage movement and their continued efforts. This video depicts a rising and setting sun with various layers of color coming in and out of view. It also shows many phrases that Loudon wished to make towards black, indigenous, and other women of color who were not heard during their time. Um, these are stills from Loudon's website. Um, I, we can't play the video due to some issues. It's part of UCA's private collection. Um, there are stills and clips on Loudon's website if you would like to see them. And if you want to see the full video, I'm sure you can get in contact with our galleries. Um, this project has been a monumental experience. Personally, I feel that it has made me think more of, in a creative way than rather than academically. It has also made me view art and how art is made in a drastically different light, which I think can only help me in the future. Having an inside look at how a work was created can completely change your perception of it. This work has also allowed me to meet and talk with some amazing artists. While I had seen some of them in the halls or on campus, I had never had a chance to interact with them. Now we become a resource for each other. So most importantly, this installation has given to the community. It has become a talking point and a safe space to discuss race, politics, and history. An example of how dynamically we can use arts as, an, as a method of celebration, remembrance and education. Though this installation is temporary, the stories of these women will live on. The goal of the separate drugs as a whole was to amplify the voices of those who were not first heard. So can you hear them? Thank you.